Our next speaker is a composer and pianist and has garnered numerous awards in both areas. He is an honorary fellow of the National Academy of Music, the founding artistic director and pianist of the American Jazz Composers Orchestra, and currently serves as the associate director of jazz at UT Arlington. Please give an upbeat welcome to Dan Cavanaugh. Thanks very much. So I'm a jazz musician, which might conjure up uh, ideas of drugs and late nights and lots of beer. Um, two of those might be true, but I, I won't say which. Uh, no, but um, you know, a lot of people, I'm what I call an insistent musician, okay? I insist that the music that I perform and compose um, needs to go out into the world, even though it might not give me the sort of personal, financial, popularity type rewards that other career paths may give me. Why would I do that? My parents would ask me that all the time when I was in college. Um, you know, I might play some solos that are crazy, that don't make sense on the surface. I might compose music that makes people walk out of the room during the middle of the concert. Um, I might play uh, music that sounds like a thousand buzzing bees underwater all at the same time. You know, why do I do this? What is the point of me doing this? I think people who are not insistent musicians and insistent artists like myself um, are really flummoxed by, by people like me. I insist on putting music out there that challenges people. It's challenging music, all right? I, I've talked a lot to people who come to these concerts and come away afterwards with something else. And I'm gonna talk about the something else today. It's not necessarily beautiful in the most traditional sense, right? But it is something that I can give them as a performer. So I'm gonna talk about that today. Um, I got my start as a musician, um, very much like any American child taking music lessons. I went through the method books, you know, learning how to read music notation, learning about music theory, playing in piano contests because apparently music is a sport. Um, <laughs> it's not. Uh, <laughs> my, you know, my mom took piano lessons when she was younger, uh, along with all her other 10 siblings, uh, which is pretty amazing to me how my grandmother and grandfather you know, appreciated that amount of practicing in their house, I'll never know. Um, <laughs> My dad taught himself to play guitar when he was younger, and so when I was little, you know, I would hear Mr. Bojangles as my nursery rhyme at night, you know, <laughs> strumming along on the guitar. Only a few of you know what that is, I guess. <laughs> yeah, look it up. Okay, um, but anyway, you know, I went through childhood. I, I started, I'm gonna come down here and play a couple things that I was working on when I was a child. I started off with the great method book compositions like Pat the Cat, you know, and Lazy Lion and things like that. And then maybe I, I graduated up to a tune called Sweet Georgia Porcupine. Okay, something like that. I didn't practice that before this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I also, um, you know, had this great dream of playing that great Schroeder moment piece, you know, <laughs> Beethoven's Fear Elise. that piece, you know, the great Charlie Brown moment. So anyway, um, you know, I finally was able to do that by about sixth or seventh grade. It took me a while. Um, but you know, I had a great teacher growing up. When I got to be in sixth grade, my family moved out to the suburbs. Because of that, the piano teacher literally just down the block was no longer just down the block. She was 25 miles away. And so I had to find a new piano teacher. Went through a couple. I ended up with a jazz piano teacher. Okay, and um, I kind of started going down this rabbit hole that is jazz music and challenging music in general, and that's kind of what has turned me into an insistent musician, okay? Because I tend to play music, and I insist upon it, that might not make you happy. Sometimes I do, not all the time. 
okay? This is a unique human phenomenon to me. Um, and, and I think it's actually uniquely human. I don't know if there's ever been studies on this. I couldn't find any. Um, but I don't think animals present artworks that are intentionally ugly. Um, <laughs> they might. You know, there, there are some great examples of animals doing art, but not in this same way. So because it's such a unique human activity, I think it deserves some serious attention, not only from from me who thinks about this all day long and tries to write music like this and, and tries to evangelize it, but from you. I think that's really important as well. I call this the grand insistence. It's kind of like the grand bargain that President Obama and Congress are trying to do with the budget right now. Um, they're failing, but um, this, this is what I call it. It's a big idea. The grand insistence that artists who are doing this kind of thing insist upon this regardless of whether or not they're gonna get famous or whether or not you're gonna like it, etc. Most of the musicians that I know um, are driven by a fundamental need to communicate with their fellow human beings. Really deep down fundamental need to communicate. Okay, I think I fit into that category. I have played many gigs where there, there have been fewer people in the audience than there have been in the band on stage, okay? Uh, and um, because of that, I think we need to search out people who do that. Because usually these people have something very serious to say with their art, all right? So if we find these insistent musicians, these insistent artists that are doing these things, we can be rewarded very greatly. Um, there's a really great example of someone like this, and he's actually from around Dallas-Fort Worth, Ornette Coleman. Ornette Coleman is a great free jazz saxophone player and composer um, who is, is almost the epitome of an insistent musician. He started practicing his way of playing jazz music, or just music, in the 1950s. Um, and he was experimenting with these ideas of eliminating things like chord symbols, um, or structures of songs. We know structures as things like, uh, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus, bridge, chorus, chorus. You know, we're very familiar with how that works. He was experimenting with these things. Long story short, he, um, in, in the 50s, late 50s, he was in a concert in Los Angeles with some very famous jazz musicians, the elder statesmen of jazz of the day. And um, it was his turn to solo, and all of these other musicians walked off stage in protest because of the way Ornette was playing. Very unique thing he was doing. What if Ornette would have listened to them? What if he would have said, okay, you know, seven people who are this all stars in my field just walked off to the stage all at once because of how I played? What if he would have listened? We would have missed out on an incredible opportunity to expand our thinking, not only about music, right, but about structure and the things outside of music and how we can push away at those walls, right? I imagine that the insistent musicians are the people with elbows in a crowd who are pushing out culture. They're making room for more culture. They're giving it to us. So, luckily Ornette Coleman did not do that and he's had a very long and fruitful career that's still happening um, in improvised music. He uh, was awarded the 2007 Pulitzer Prize in music for, for doing just that. You know, what's ironic, ironic to me is that we don't listen to these people, right? We don't listen to them until they're after they're dead. It's pretty funny. So, so history has a way of doing this, and it's not just with artists and musicians and things, but um, we say, hey, look, these people were very important to the time in which they lived, but we never give them that designation when they are alive. It's very ironic. So what I'm challenging all of us to do is to find those people who are doing that. Now, the alive ones, not the dead ones on recordings, not the obscure ones that we happen to have a bootleg of from the 1940s, right? Find those people now and go find it. I have a piece of music here that I uh, um, composed for big band, and it's probably gonna sound like pretty challenging music to most of you. So it's about 20 seconds long. Take a listen here, and uh, I'll explain it in a minute. Here we go. Okay, well, I'm gonna sit at the piano and do it then. Good thing I'm a jazz musician. I'm, I can improvise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, 
<laughs> this is going to be hard to do because it was for big band. Uh, but there are some trombones in the excerpt that go like this. Okay, so there's like a phrase there. What happens is this follow the leader idea. Okay, so the first trombone, who's the leader, does that. He goes like this, or she. And then all the other trombones come along and do it. All right, that kind of thing. So you can imagine what that might sound like. Um, the trumpets then come in and do it. So what, what does this have to do with anything outside of music, except for you wouldn't want to put this on at a cocktail party with your boss there, right? Um, this Composing this work, and actually a few others like it that use the same principle, really gave me um, a lot of more sophisticated understanding for concepts of leadership and what that entails. So leadership is not only bringing others along with you and telling them what that is, telling them what to do, but it's also exposing other people's greatness, um, letting other people shine, right? All these other things that leadership entail. Without working on this, I wouldn't have had the ability to kind of understand leadership in that way. And I propose that that's the same way as a listener. You have to delve into it a little more, but it's there. So um, in closing, uh, I think it's really important for us, like I said, to go out and find these insistent musicians. And this applies to all artists, poets, dancers, painters, uh, you know, choreographers, all this kind of thing, performance art people, whatever. Um, we need to find the insistent artists and listen to them now, not after they're dead. The theme of this TEDx event is moving forward. Well, here's a great way to move forward a lot quicker. Figure out the big ideas now. All these ideas in these great insistent musicians' artworks are really big ideas, but we don't end up appreciating them until after they're dead. So I propose, I want you to go out and find someone in the next year and go to their show. Go to an art gallery with crazy art. Go to an improvised music concert with it, crazy music, whatever. Find the ideas in that and insist that other people do the same. Thank you very much.